Well, here we are. Absolutely fantastic uh, to be here and speaking to you all. Uh, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful event that we've got planned for this evening for the next hour and a half. I just like to say that I'm absolutely personally moved and, and humbled that we've got nearly 200 people uh, coming on to this session today. And there's a lot of names already popping up that I've that have helped me in the past, and particularly one or two people that mean a lot to me in terms of my health and safety career, and were there for me as a, a veteran. And, and this is what we're trying to do now. Um, and just as a quick bit of background, this was originally a WhatsApp between two old friends, myself and Mark Roberts. And it's now progressed to this. And we're going to take this as far as we can go, everyone. Um, where does it go? It goes maybe towards a LinkedIn group. IOS will jump on board. I know they will. And we just we gain momentum now and we keep this going. And and the three, sorry, the four people that we have speaking to you, some of you know, Sarah, Josh and Louise, are all experts in their own field. Before I go any further, I'd just like to say thank you to IOS uh, for taking the time to put this together. The media team, uh, Dimple, um, one of the uh, uh, my Irish colleagues, uh, is on hand in the background. And, and Dimple and the team have, have put this together. And I know maybe six or seven weeks sounds a long time, but in reality now, it, it doesn't to get something like this together and pull it together. So IOS haven't let me or, or you down, so it's fantastic. So um, just a bit about me for some of you. Um, again, my name is... Uh, Jimmy Quinn. Uh, I'll be the next president of IOSH. I can't wait. And part of my strategy going forward is going to be all about veterans, uh, young people, colleges, universities, and, and well-being, uh, tapping into all the different areas of that. Uh, and there are three major strands that I'm going to be going. Um, Ashley, can you just take off your mic a second, please? Uh, Dimple will take off your mic for you. I'm just going to introduce Ashley St. John for one minute, or one or two minutes, uh, and then I'm going to continue on through the webinar. Um, Ash is, um, has, uh, is, a, is a veteran and to set up the ample succumbent within his business and he just wants to have a quick chat with you all, well, a couple of minutes and then we'll move on and our first panellist after that will be Mark who I'll introduce. Off you go Ash. That's great, thanks Jimmy, much appreciated. Um, so how are you folks speaking to you from East Lancashire just now? Um, I've been out of the military since 93 having done just short of five years in the Royal Navy. Started in small ships and big ships, uh, successfully run my own adventure training company and gone into health, safety and quality management and audit since. Um, I'm currently a silver award holder in my own right for my own consulting firm and I'm nurturing my current employer through a bronze into silver application. So things for all of us as veterans to remember, the network is massive folks. It's absolutely huge and there are so many opportunities through uh, people like the Career Transition Partnership, CTP, Officers Association, RFEA, Ford Assist, Forces Family Jobs, uh, College of Military Veterans and Emergency Services up at UCLAN, Lancashire Armed Forces Covenant, RBL, and Northwest RFCA, to mention but a few. And I would encourage all of you to reach out as a veteran and network with other people with a military background. So ourselves, we can offer uh, work placements for folks in health and safety within the business. So if you're transitioning out, if you're going to be a service leave in the next two to three months, um, you can apply to us and we can take you on and give you three months of experience in a business, uh, co-working the health and safety side of stuff. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really good. With Jim's permission, I'm going to make sure you've all got my contact details. Um, if you've got any questions, if you wanted to reach out, you can help us network with the the other bronze, silver and gold Armed Forces Covenant Employer uh, Engagement Award Scheme holders, of which in the Northwest, we've got about 10% of the UK in terms of bronze, silver and gold. Again, more about that uh, directly. If you want to drop us a, an email, I can send you loads of information. Enjoy this evening. Thanks for your time, Jimmy, and uh, much appreciated and good luck to all. Thanks very much, Ash, and um, feel free to put your details if you want onto the chat there uh, and uh, people will be able to get in touch with you directly as well and uh, I'm going to be asking all the group later on that we want to retain their email addresses through IOSH not through me under the GDPR and, and then create some sort of a uh, group with that but that's something we'll, we'll discuss later on so thanks again Ash. Okay then so um, our first panellist um, for some of you uh, will need no introduction at all uh, his name is Mark Roberts I've known Mark Best, best part of 15 to 18 years, maybe a little bit longer. 
Uh, we served together in the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers as regimental specialists. And Mark, like me, had uh, two careers, uh, or two regiments and corps. Uh, I was Scots Guards, and then I was uh, remains. I've done 12 years in each, and Mark was similar. So um, thank you very much for having a listen, and it's over to you, uh, Mark. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Jim. Uh, good evening, everybody. And let me say um, how grateful and honoured I am to have this opportunity uh, to speak to you guys. Uh, so thanks to Jimmy and thanks to IOSH. Uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, I just want to cover basically my journey from the military side of things um, to the city side of things and to where I am now and to share a few experiences and to highlight a few things that I found. And, and I guess it's fair to say that ultimately found me in some ways. Uh, my experience is no different than many of you for those that have already left and it's not intended in any way to bring any kind of attention or focus on me rather it's an effort to perhaps i guess cover some fundamentals to shine a light in a few corners to highlight some difficulties uh, and to draw some some comparisons so really i guess um without going into my military career straight away but one of the first things that i found when I left the forces in 2010, was that drinking excessively, using non-PC language, and having a dark, ridiculous sense of humour, wasn't it wasn't particularly <clears throat> accepted that well um, in Civvy Street. And it was as much as it's an obvious thing now to say. And I had a brief discussion with um, Louise earlier about this. It's it's something that I initially found quite difficult. Now, my wife and children are immune to this, as many of you will experience the same in your families. Uh, we, we, you know, we curse and we say things sometimes that would break windows. But in the military, it's accepted. But the biggest thing for me, apart from that, um, was also <laughs> it was being called by my first name. The only time I was called Mark was when my mum told me off. So I think the whole sense of humour thing and the name element was a very initial but very profound aspect of my stepping outside of the green skin and become a civilian. The other thing that found me pretty much straight away, despite every effort I could make to the contrary, uh, was depression. Now depression isn't something that is easy to talk about. Guys don't really like, or any, nobody really likes talking about it, but I've always found that it's not an easy subject to broach or to admit to, but it found me and I was on medication for a while. And it was that initial run up to handing my ID card in and actually the physical act of stepping through the gate and realizing that that part of my life was actually behind me after the ground rush of, of the two years preceding that. So by way of a, bri you know, a, a brief resume about my military career, as Jimmy mentioned just now, I had um, the distinct honor to serve in two corps. I was born and raised, if you want to call it that, in the Royal Engineers. I joined the engineers in 1988. I was already a qualified carpenter. I was 23, so I was an old man by many standards, and please don't make any comment about how old I look now. Um, but I went into training in Minley in 1988 um, as a 23-year-old qualified carpenter. So after basic, I went to Chatham and proved that I could indeed butcher wood to a significant degree, and I was paid a little bit more. And I was then posted to Germany to 3-5 Engineer Regiment, which in those days was in Hamel. Um, and I spent five years serving in 2-9 Field Squadron, which was a fantastic place to be. Um, and that was my education. Those were my school years, if you want to call it that. So that's where I really found my feet and I realised I, I could do this soldiering thing. So from there, I was posted back to the UK. Um, I took the Royal Engineers Junior NCOs Instructors Carter and I went to ATR Basingbourne, where I made some very good friends, several of which I'm still in contact now. And I'll come on to that in just a few minutes. From Basingbourne, I went to Chatham, Chatham to Maidstone, short tour at Maidstone, and then I was posted back across into the instruction and training world because um, of the qualifications I had previously, I joined uh, what was then the Royal Engineers Apprentice Wing in Minley, soon to become 82 Training Squadron, posted to Arborfield, which is the Remy Centre of Excellence at the time. Uh, and as a Royal Engineer in the Remy environment, we kind of took the place by storm slightly. And I don't say that lightly, we really made a difference. But it was at that time I had my first experience of, um, I guess, personal drama and hardship. But I was in uniform and there was a support structure around. My wife and I suffered a miscarriage, we lost twins, um, and we went through the mill. But at that time, the Corps was really ramping up, um, getting ready for what was to become operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, and things were getting busier on the ground, and there just wasn't the capacity to give me a welfare post. 
So at the time when my wife and I were really trying to have a family, she said to me, that's enough, I want you out. And I, my world dropped away quite quickly. I managed to find a way of staying in uniform and I transferred into the remit. And that was one of the emotional aspects of this, not only the whole personal drama, but the act of taking out the fat cap badge, the Royal Engineer cap badge and putting the Remy one into my, my, my headdress was um, profound actually. But I joined Borden for a static posting. My wife and I went on to have two beautiful bouncing boys um, and my life moved on from there. I spent 10 years in the Remy. Um, being 10 years in any unit, you can all appreciate that you get moved around, you do different things. But the last two years was really what I want to speak about. I had the opportunity to take that full 24 months of resettlement and use it to its maximum effect. And I did every day as much as I could. All my enhanced learning credits I used. I put a plan in place. I had several discussions, although there was nothing formal, the kind of information you guys are going to get tonight, I never had. And many of us never had at the time. Um, but I realized that nobody wanted to touch health and safety. So I put my hand up and I went for it. So we did. So I quite quickly got my NGC and my fire uh, safety and risk management. And in my final 12 months, I did my NEBOSH diploma. And out of a course of 12, I was one of three that passed. So by the time my turn came to walk out the gate and hand in my ID card to what should have been the chief clerk, but he was off sick. So I handed it into a Lance Corporal who just went, yeah, cheers boss. That was the extent of my um, emotional, here's my ID card. By the time that happened, I was fairly well qualified, but only because I managed to use that last two years. So I then went on um, and got a job with Surrey County Council, which I can best describe now was like walking into a woke environment. It was, it was the complete antichrist from everything that I'd experienced at that point. Um, I stayed there for 18 months, worked hard at it, and I admit to leaving behind, consciously leaving behind, pretty much every military network that I'd ever built up and I was a part of. I didn't turn my back on people, but I decided fairly early on, which compounded the depressive element, that I needed to make a go of the civilian element. So I really just left the, the green skin behind completely, which was a mistake. So I stayed with Surrey County Council for 18 months, went into consultancy, health and safety and fire consultancy, um, without eating a tofu sandwich or growing a man bun, um, and I managed to progress slowly. But it was about that time um, that I was told I had cancer. So the prostate cancer was a bit of a shock for anyone that's been through something similar, and there won't be many listening to this that haven't been touched in some way by cancer. When you're told by a doctor in a darkened room, which in my case it was, that you've got that dreaded C word, um, you, your world quite quickly changes, and the depressive element of things quite quickly came back. And I very soon realized that I didn't have a welfare officer. I had uh, no one to turn to, no financial backup. It was me. And that was it. And the lady next to me that I've been married to for 25 years at that particular time, whose world had just fallen away and she was crying worse than I was. So at that point, things started to get real and I had to focus quite quickly. But then it happened. And this is the point in this little lesson or, or experience that I'm trying to put across. After almost two years, of turning my back on uniform, I had a phone call from someone right out of the blue, someone that I had in fact spoken to for eight years. And it was someone that I took through basic training in 1995. The engineers listening to this may recognize Ben Hughes, um, who's a larger than life man physically and a larger than life character. Uh, ben phoned me out of nowhere uh, and organized something that really changed my mindset, pulled me back into the military um, community as it were and a bunch of military lads and I got together and they just abused me they ragged me to pieces and quite quickly my attitude changed I'd missed it I'd missed the banter I'd missed the like-mindedness and I'd missed the support element that the military brings um, for those that can see behind me there's a picture on the wall we organized a trip um, up Kilimanjaro and we raised a lot of money for cancer relief so that was my experience of the military stepping back into my life after I turned my back on it and really saving the day so basically from that, I moved forward. I had the operation, came back into the health and safety world and I've progressed since. So that's really all I want to say in terms of my progression. It's short and sharp and you can appreciate time here is limited. I'd love to go into more detail. But the biggest lessons, I guess, and the comparisons that I'd like to make, there are six. Um, <laughs> forgive me for looking down at this. The initial realization that my time in uniform was coming to end was emotional and difficult, far more emotional difficult and difficult than I anticipated. Um, but it forced me to focus 
and achieve a level of qualification that I didn't think I'd be able to, but I did. And that won't be unique. Many of you will be in the same position. A knowledge of the job marketplace is essential and knowing what employers see as either desirable or essential is important to the success successful failure of either getting a job and making a go of things and being able to pay a mortgage or not. Working in a non-military environment isn't easy. It really isn't easy. Um, there's a dog eat dog attitude that I didn't anticipate and it took me by surprise. Cutting our, ourselves off from military friends, networks and organizations is not a good idea. I don't believe, I absolutely rely on this uh, and it saved my life. Um, a friend pulled me out of a dark place and literally turned my mindset around. There are some excellent sources of information out there, not least IOSH, uh, but networking and interacting with peers and other professionals is crucial. It's helped me time and time again. The chance to talk to people that really know the job market, the best or most desired qualifications and levels of experience coupled with insight into the way health and safety is developing and changing, it's difficult to find and it's priceless. There is an excellent SAPA network on Facebook at the moment um, called Health and Safety SAPA. It's got to the ground by another uh, ex-Royal Engineer, Bernie Bolton, that for those SAPAs out there not a part of it, I highly recommend it to you. That, guys, is really all I have to say. Um, but on that note, if anybody's got any questions for me, if there's anything I can help with, don't hesitate to give me a question either on here or find me on Facebook and I will come back to you. But in the meantime, uh, I'll hand you back to Jim uh, for the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And if uh, you can just turn your mic off, that'd be fantastic. You know, just before I move on to our next panelist, the, the stuff that Mark's talked about there um, is exactly, Mark, if you turn your camera off, mate. Okay, my, I don't know if my camera's going on, uh, Dimple. Um, so basically, to cut a long story short, um, the stuff that Mark's talking about there is exactly what happened to me. I made the same mistake. I cut myself off from everyone, but I was lucky and I've made this very, very uh, apparent in a lot of webinars that I've done that luckily I found IOSH and having that branch meetings and the new Health and Safety College was, was, was a godsend to me and I went down that sort of same path as, as Mark. So thanks very much, Mark. Um, you know, in terms of the office politics, that's one of the worst things that you, you, get, you get into. It's worse than the sounds, it's mess, it's horrendous. Okay. So over to Sarah Jones now, um, just to let you know, um, Sarah is a, a leading career team and executive coach who has spoken for us on IOS before. Um, Sarah works with individuals and organisations to help them identify with what they want, uh, what's holding them back and, and how to get there. In, in short, how to make the most of the fantastic skills that us veterans have. Um, Sarah is going to discuss her experience of coaching veterans uh, and give us tips on your career that you can use. Over to you, Sarah. Thanks, thanks, Jimmy. And I just want to say a massive thank you to Mark for what you've just shared there. It can't be easy to uh, share that kind of personal information. And I was really struck by what you've said. And uh, as, as Jimmy says, I have um, coached a number of people that have left the forces and decided they want to embark on a new career. And all the things that you've talked about already this evening in terms of being either cutting yourself off or being cut off from that support infrastructure and those networks before are all things that I've encountered when working with people that have left the military, the forces, etc. So these are all very common themes and the ability to kind of almost restructure yourself, reparent yourself from having come from quite a structured environment but an environment where you do have each other's backs. And I know that one of the gentlemen that I coached really, really, you know, a very capable, very smart guy. He's now in a fantastic training role in a large organization. But the biggest shift for him was really identifying what his, 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 his key skills are and what he has to offer. And I think statistics are saying that 17,000 people leave the forces each year. I know there are organizing organizations out there to help you and particularly with IOSH I mean if health and safety isn't the most one of the most important things with what's happened over the last few months I don't know when it will ever be so you're in the right place to get some help but certainly the idea of coming from a very structured environment where when things really do you know when you really do need to have each other's back you're there for people that was a real game changer and a real mindset shift 
for the guy that I was working with and in terms of finding that kind of role where you do support others because he was used to that in his previous role in the armed forces and that led him to work for an organization that had a very similar kind of criteria and company values. So I'm going to give you some tips now that will help you whether you are you know, whatever stage you are in your career. And these will help you to start identify what you can do to sort of really find what it is you want to do whilst recognizing the challenges that you have. I'm just gonna change my talk a little bit in terms of, I talk about change um, in many, many of the talks that I do and, and many of the coaching sessions or training sessions that I do. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's a whole, there's a whole set of theories around change and the fact that the feelings that we have during change can feel like being in a washing machine. As human beings, we do not like uncertainty. We like to know we're directing ourselves. We try and control as much as we can in our lives and we like to have that certainty. So when things are done to us or our environment changes, that can make us feel really, really adrift. And we have a whole mixture of emotions such as fear, denial, anger, grief. And the thing is, these feelings don't stop or start. It can be a bit like a washing machine. But what I want to say to you is if you start taking some small steps and you speak to somebody and get some help about how you're feeling, it is literally a problem shared is a problem halved. And having somebody objective that can listen and understand and validate your feelings is really, really important. Otherwise, we can end up going through that washing machine time and time and time again. But what I will say, change is like a tunnel. There's a beginning and you drive through and there's an end. And I'm sure, as you guys probably know, fear hates action. The best way to build your fearlessness muscle is to start taking action. So I really wanted to start with that kind of feeling of change, which sometimes you're aware of, or sometimes it just feels like a really, you know, uncomfortable feeling in your pit of your stomach. So it's not unusual and it's not unique to people that are in the forces, but you might be experiencing that. And that is part of the change process. And if you want to move forward, you will get there. So a few tips for you now. Okay, so if you want to start thinking about what kind of career or role do I want to have? What kind of organization do I want to be in? Or perhaps what even kind of business do I want to set up? There's something called the career line. And what you can do is get a piece of paper and turn it on its side like this so it's horizontal and almost draw a horizontal line. And this is your timeline and have a look at whether you have been studying, whether you've had various roles in the armed forces, or whether you've had a few roles, and really look at all those different milestones and identify what were the things, what were the activities I really enjoyed? What was the environment that I really enjoyed? Where did I really succeed? Where did I have those moments where I felt in the flow? Because what we want is to get to more of those in the flow moments, because when you're there, you realize you're in a career that broadly speaking, whilst there's always things in our jobs that we don't like, it's going to suit you. So for example, if I look back at my career, I can see that my former career in crisis management communications has a lot of similarities with coaching, which is all about dealing with challenges and finding solutions and moving forward. So really do that career line, all the different roles, what you've studied, you can even add in there, what kind of books do you like to read? What kind of you know, TV do you like? What, what films do you watch even? And see what you can put on there that identifies the, th identify the things that you really enjoy and put in there you know, where you feel in the flow. So put as much as that information down there and then sort of try it over a few days, see what comes back to you. You can also add a column for what feedback have I ever had in my career, be that in the armed forces or since I've left and see if there are any similarities around somebody giving you what I call legitimate feedback, not just that was a great job, because I mean, that doesn't really say much. But if somebody said, Do you know what, Fred, you were really good at this because or I really admired the way you did this, that again, this is like being your own detective and you can start doing this now. All you need is a sheet of paper and a bit of time and a bit of reflection. Have a look at that feedback and see what pops out for you. So look back through the experiences, 
and see if you can start to join the dots to say, hang on a minute, there's something I like about being in a team. There's something I like about maybe working on my own. I was actually really good at technology at school. See if you can find some of these red threads. They will be there, I promise. So it's a bit of an iterative process, but keep going, keep going. The other pieces as well, LinkedIn. Couldn't not have a presentation and not talked about LinkedIn, which is literally the world's biggest free research database if you are looking for your career, for your next career, or for ideas of where you want to go. So I'm sure some of you, most of you have probably got a profile. Make sure you've got a professional shop that you've filled in your profile accordingly with your experiences and more importantly, what you've achieved and list your skills at the bottom and don't be scared to ask for recommendations or endorsements of your skills, whatever those skills are that you want to put on there. You can flick it on to say you're looking for opportunities, but also in terms of research, you can follow companies, you can look at what they're posting, you can set up job alerts, and you can try a few different parameters and see if you can get a flavor for, actually, I'm kind of drawn to this kind of job that has this kind of content within it. Or, do you know what, there's somebody that I know and I really admire what they've done in their career, I'd love to do that. And follow a few of those people and just see if you can see what their career path was, what skills have they acquired along the way that's helped them. So this is really about being a bit of a detective really and also follow your instincts. So much of my coaching is about allowing people to admit what they've been too scared to admit to themselves. And that's whether the people that I've coached that have left the forces or whether those are, you know, people that have been CEOs or people starting out in business. Very often we hold ourselves back and I don't want you guys to do that. You know, really, you know, even if it's by yourself and you write it down where nobody can see or you're talking to a mentor in complete impartiality and confidentiality, just take that time to admit, you know what, I've always really wanted to do this because um, science and data and research has shown that the quicker you make changes, uh, when you feel the impetus to make changes, the better it is for your mental health. The longer you leave it, the more it erodes self-esteem, self-confidence and impacts mental health later. It's never, you're never too young, you're never too old. So have a look at some of those tools and tips tonight. And also, you know, you can even try volunteering or asking for a placement and just seeing what else is out there. Again, depending on where you are in your career. So those are just a few, few tips I can give you tonight. The other thing I wanted to leave you with is really be careful who you share your goals with. I know IOSH is a really supportive network. I've spoken for them before. I can speak to the caliber of the people in the organization, but be careful. Don't get yourself around these energy vampires. You know those people where you say, do you know what? I've always really fancied setting up my own IT business or I've always fancied doing this. And they say, oh, why do you want to do that? That's not about you, that's about the other person. It doesn't mean they're a bad person, it's just they are limited by their own experience and maybe their own fears and beliefs. So just make sure you're sharing your goals with people that can lift you up and get you going. So yeah, those are my tips for this evening. I will share my contact details later because on my website I've got tons of free tools that can help you start to make those career steps. So back to Jimmy. Wow, I could listen to you all night, Sarah. Thanks very much. And, and Mark as well, you know, there's some of the stuff you were coming out that, that Sarah came into there as well, which is fantastic. Um, I just wanted to bring one thing up just before we move on, Sarah. Um, and this is from Alex Spinks. Sarah, I totally agree that coaching is a must for those leaving the forces. If you've served a full career, it's paramount that you learn to deal with people and attitudes different to those in the military. Being able to adapt is a key attribute, but recognising what you need to adapt is difficult. I had a great coach and it was a huge benefit. For those without the opportunity I was given on how to you how for the, for those without the opportunity I was given, how do you advise people to identify these areas and we need to adapt? So take that one away and then and um it's on the QA and and we'll, that'll be the first question when we move on. Okay, okay. so we'll do that Thanks. later. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, we're moving on now um to our our next panelist and um this next panelist is is someone who I've spoken to many times, and and not only is Josh um, a leader in recruitment in his own right, and I don't want to embarrass him, um, he's also the uh, founding trustee, a founding trustee of Safety for Good, which is a, which is another great organisation that I'm involved in, uh, and he's a director of Principal People. He's a huge job, and he's he's given up his time for us today. 
Um, leading a, a wide variety of recruitment teams within principal people, along with delivering a wide level of executive level HSEQ searches, so much as well placed to assist individuals at all levels of HSEQ career. Um, just before we, we move on, um, Josh, um, when I asked him, it was straight in there, and he is going to give you as much advice as he can about how it looks out there, and I think he's going to talk about CV as well. If he hasn't, I've just thrown him under the bus. Apologies. Over to you, Josh. No, no, all good, Jimmy. Thank you very much. Um, so let me just share my screen with you all. Great. So um, I hope you can all see that. Um, So uh, firstly, thank you very much, Jimmy, for giving me the privilege um, of speaking to you all today. Um, and I hope that my perspective in this is useful for you all. Um, and I'd like to take the opportunity at the beginning to say that um, my team and I would be delighted to talk to you all individually on a one-to-one -one basis if you would like it, um, if there are any questions that come up. So don't be afraid to get in contact afterwards and we'll be uh, more than happy to, to help you guys out. Um, so. Um, who are we? Um, so principal people, some of you may have heard of us. Uh, we specialise within HSEQ and sustainability recruitment, both in the UK and internationally. But Safety for Good, as Jimmy mentioned, um, is, a, is a charity that we created. And Safety for Good was born out of us recognising the negative impression that the health and safety profession has within the wider community. I think for us um, and myself, I've been in this industry now for nearly 10 years. Um, we see the amazing work that health and safety professionals do each and every day um, and how that actually in the media that's portrayed in a negative light. And for us, what we wanted to do with Safety for Good was to raise the positive profile of the profession within the UK. Um, so we got together with a group of leading individuals within the HSEQ industry. Of course, we got IOSH involved and also the British Safety Council. And what we look to do is create initiatives and schemes to move the profession forward. Um, we try to um, change the misunderstanding in three ways, as I've listed below. But um, I think the most important part of this that could be useful for you veterans is around the mentoring of not only young, but also new entrants into the health and safety profession. And because we really have a goal and we believe that individuals with the right behavioral competence can become the future leaders. So um, that's something that I want to talk in a bit more detail about today. Um, some useful information that I thought I would share with you was in relation to a recent survey that we conducted with a range of HSEQ leaders um, off the back of COVID-19. Um, so we surveyed uh, about 30 HSEQ leaders and a wider variety of 150 professionals at all different levels. Um, and we split these into four different industry sectors and um, which are available for you to download. Um, and when the slides get shared, you can click on the links to do so. Um, but I thought a couple of key uh, statistics that came out of the uh, reports were very interesting and things that we could uh, talk through. So the first is that um, we saw that 21% of the respondents felt that COVID-19 would actually result in positive recruitment opportunities within their organisation, um, as opposed to 16% who predicted redundancies. So although I know in the current world it's a difficult time and, and we are now officially in a recession, but actually opportunities within health and safety, um, as were highlighted earlier, haven't, haven't actually been um, this good in, in a while because uh, organisations are realising the importance of this. So I think that's important to highlight. Um, I think also 76% um, uh, of respondents felt that it would positively impact the profession. Um, but I think one of the most important points that actually came out of this was that we saw that m more respondents, and it was about 47% of our respondents, favoured the behavioural competence of individuals rather than the technical competence. And for us, I think that's something that we've seen uh, throughout our recruitment processes. Um, and it's really important to understand that, that behavioural competence is absolutely crucial. And although um, a lot of you may ha not have experience in health and safety, you've got a vast amount of experience through the trials and tribulations that you've gone through being in the forces. And if we can harness and highlight that to prospective employers, then it's a win-win situation. I think lastly, 67% um, of individuals felt that COVID-19 had resulted in a greater focus on mental health and well-being. Um, this is an emerging uh, topic in the industry. And I know Jimmy mentioned that in his presidential year, it will be something that he really wishes to push forward. But again, something for you guys to research, be aware of and utilize uh, when you move forward in your careers. 
So some tips to um, improve yourself and advance your career prospects. Um, I've said it already, but I think mentoring is absolutely crucial. And I appreciate that most of you have large networks within the forces. Um, and it's really important not to forget them as, as you've come out. But the networks that you could get through Safety for Good or IOSH in terms of mentoring will give you the opportunity to speak to individuals who have been on different journeys and can really help and harness your career in a wider capacity. I think it was mentioned earlier, um, but volunteering for real work experience can be a, cr a, a crucial part of your career um, and it does pay off. In the last 12 months at Principal People, we've seen three individuals that have, I think two of them were ex-forces, um, who have uh, volunteered for unpaid work experience and through that have been off actually offered permanent positions with those organisations because of how impressive they've been in that uh, period of time. So if there is opportunity for you to get uh, work experience, I know it can seem a bit um, counterproductive, but getting that experience will really help you move forward in your career. Um, networking, absolutely crucial. I think the idea of the groups that could come out of this uh, will be fantastic for you all. Um, but not just with IOSH, there are a number of other groups that you should look at because um, the networking at different levels in different areas is, is, is crucial. And also engage with a number of recruitment organisations. I mean, there's, there's us, but there's a number of other specialists in this market. And having a few good relationships is really key as people who can guide and advise you from a career perspective. Uh, we recently did an article around how to develop your personal brand, which includes in a bit more detail around your CV and, uh, uh, and, and how your personal brand is projected through LinkedIn and others. Um, I recommend again looking at that because it goes into a lot more detail. Um, which was put together by one of our directors, Tara Waterman. Um, and lastly, I've, I've touched on it already, but spend time on your behavioural competence rather than purely your technical. I think for us, um, we really do see that ex-forces individuals have such amazing behavioural competence that they learn um, that you can really utilise in your commercial career. And I put a few key objectives there around coaching, collaboration, the ability to, and adaptability to overcome change. But there are a number of skills that you learn through being in the forces that uh, individuals that haven't um, won't have. And I think it's really important to harness those. Moving on to your CV. And again, there's a, there's a, this could take a long time to run through everything. So I've tried to be, I've tried to be quite concise myself. Um, I think firstly, always being clear and concise in your CV is absolutely crucial. I hear people talk about a two page CV, um, a four page CV, to me, there's so much you can put into a CV. As long as it's relevant and concise, it's important to include. But I would, I would recommend no longer than four pages. Um, but I think the two page thing can be quite limiting and uh, I, I personally don't recommend it. Next, always include key achievements in your CV and don't forget to make them tangible. A key achievement must be something that you have already achieved. Um, but what and what clients are generally looking for is how does that relate to what you could do in their organization. So don't just talk about the fact that you improved something, say, say by how much did you improve it or what was the result of the improvement that you made. Really important to make them tangible. You should tailor your profile to every job you apply for. So um, it needs to highlight the specific qualities and skill sets that you have that the client has uh, mentioned that they're looking for in their job description or advert, which really highlight and show your suitability. Uh, the key skills section, especially where you don't have direct experience in the market, it's important to highlight again your key skills, and these can be really about the behavioural competence that you have. Um, but I would advise going to sort of four or five of those. Um, also, hobbies and interests do get looked at. I know that you all lead interesting lives and it's important to put a bit of flavour about who you are individually in your CV. Don't go into overkill again, but a couple of, a couple of points are, are really interesting. And you might have common interests with somebody that you're interviewing with, which can be an, uh, an area of conversation. And, uh, and lastly, we do have a CV template. So if you'd like to, to see one or uh, get in contact with my team, we'd be happy to share that. And lastly, for me, uh, before I go, um, uh, interview preparation. Now, some of these are basic tips and I don't want you to feel like I'm teaching you to suck eggs, but um, from some research that we've recently seen, um, there was, it was found that nearly 45% of individuals back the late, the, uh, the, lacked the basic knowledge of a company and the contact they were meeting um, at uh, an interview. So using the, their website, using their LinkedIn, 
pulling off their financial reports. All of these things are basic and should be done, but most people forget to do them. So please make sure you're doing your research on the company. We always recommend a conservative appearance. Of course, you have personality and you have flair, but at an interview stage, it's best to be as conservative as possible um, because that can make the difference sometimes. Something that we really look to help our candidates with is preparing their answers to likely questions beforehand. Um, once you know what the client's looking for, it's very easy to predict the types of questions that they're likely to ask you. So if you can answer those questions predetermined before you go into that interview, you'll feel more confident, you'll be more concise and more impactful in your answers that you give. We utilize and teach our candidates around the STAR technique in answering questions. Um, so uh, this st stands for situation, task, action and result. Um, again, I've got supporting information which I can give you, but it's really important to use this. It's how you structure your answers and to get the best out of them. Um, Following up, follow up correspondence is absolutely crucial. And although some people find it a bit old fashioned, um, I'll just tell you that last month we had a candidate who was rejected at a second stage interview who followed up with the client directly to say that they were really um, pleased to meet them. Sad they didn't get the role, but if anything else came up, they would be delighted to discuss further. The client actually came back to us to say how impressed they were with that follow up, that um, the candidate that they did offer uh, fell through and the client went back to that individual to offer them the role. So if they hadn't followed up, I don't think that would have happened. And it just goes to show a simple email to a client directly can make all the difference. And lastly, before I hand you back to Jimmy, um, again, we have interview preparation guides. Happy if you guys want to get in contact um, and, um, and we'll share those with you. Um, and anything that I or the team can do to assist you would be, uh, would be more than happy to do so. So thank you very much. And, uh, and Jimmy, I'll pass back to you. Thanks very much, Josh. Uh, and just before you do go, um, I just uh, want to give you a question. I had a question from uh, Keith Hall, and uh, Keith is asking, uh, just so you can bring this question, I'm going to bring you next. Um, um, Josh, um, how can Josh, these what OSH professionals felt would happen? Yeah, he's asking um, about recruitment, uh, how recruitment's increased in OSH professionals. And he also has asked you, um, for all of you that are on the call, all the, all the, all the panellists, um, how can OSH professionals support veterans wanting to move to all areas in business? So that will be the last question I'll ask you all today, so take that one. And Josh, um, can you give us any sort of details of how the um, OSH profession has increased in recruitment? So I'll come to that one straight away after. Okay, okay thanks okay. very much, Josh. Uh, outstanding. Um, okay, so um, just before we move on then uh, to our uh, last uh, panellist, uh, it gives me great pleasure to um, invite Louise Hoskin. Um, Louise is um, a Vice President for IOSH, however she's here today in her capacity as a very successful businesswoman. And for those entrepreneurs of you that are on this call uh, from our veterans community and anyone else, um, Louise is going to share some of her experiences with you. Um, a very, very talented businesswoman and uh, a very uh, good friend. Uh, over to you, Louise. Hi, Jimmy, and hello to everybody on the call. And the first thing I'm going to do is congratulate you, Jimmy, for a great session so far. Um, and thank you for having me on. So I'm, yeah, as Jimmy says, I'm, I'm going to share a few of my insights into um, running my own business. I have my own health and safety consultancy. Um, and along with that, I have a number of hats as well so I'm just going to run through a few slides and just share my experiences with you so um, a number of people on this call will recognize me from IOSH um, I'm a really keen volunteer um, and part of that is about giving back um, so I've actually been in OSH um, from graduating so I did an environmental health course at Nottingham Trent University um, in the early 90s. So I've actually been in this field for um, getting on for 30 years now. So being part of IOSH is part of me basically giving back um, and it means an awful lot to me. Um, what many of you may not be aware of is that I also um, have the hat of, of being a health and safety consultant. Um, and I'm an employer, so I often talk about juggling all three of those hats. 
Um, and I have a small team. There's um, six, I have six employees. Um, I also use associate consultants as well. Um, and that's something that's it's taken me a lot of time. It's built up over time. Um, I had various roles before that. Um, I worked as an environmental health officer. I was a ruthless um, regulator um, who didn't take any prisoners and loved going to court. Um, I worked for the co-op in a regional environmental health and safety role um, because I actually prosecuted them and they decided it was cheaper to take me off the streets and I, I absolutely loved that role. Um, I've worked in the construction sector um, around CDM um, and I took the role of, of you know that I was aiming for at the time which was head of environmental health and safety at Savills when I was still in my early 30s um, but for me at that time I took that business which is a big corporate business um, to where I wanted to take it and got to a point where I thought well actually what do I do from here and you know I was still in my early 30s and it was very much, um, I can either stay in the corporate world or I can go out and I can set up my own business. Um, and I guess there's going to be people on this call who are, you know, for me, that was a big transition. Um, and I guess I'm, you know, it's comparing a potential transition that you might be taking into business, but, you know, certainly for me at that point, really. Um, and I, they, I wasn't prepared for, the, for that difference and for what it meant. Um, so I had had a very, very successful role um, where the telephone never stopped ringing, everybody needed me. I had an internal team, I had HR um, there to support out, sort out whatever I needed. Um, and then the next day there's kind of nothing. And, and how are you going to create this business? So. Um, the, the slides you will have, there's an awful lot on my slides because I thought, well, you know, hopefully these will be a good takeaway for you. Um, but I just thought that I'd pick out a few sort of key points really from these slides around being a health and safety consultant. So um, the first thing I think to think about is, is really think about this carefully. Um, there's actually a link at the bottom of these slides around an article that I wrote for IOSH, which is all around becoming a health and safety consultant um, and becoming an independent and what that actually means. Mm. Um, and what I would do is just urge anybody who's considering this to, to think through all of your options um, and please look back at the slides um, that I'm going to give you but really think about it carefully before you take the plunge and consider what type of business it is that you want to create as well. Um, so there's lots of different avenues that you could potentially take if you're choosing to become a health and safety consultant um, but what you might think is a really fantastic idea um, might not translate into the marketplace. So I guess um, it's, it is important for you to think seriously about whether you have not just the right health and safety skills to deliver a product um, or a service to potential customers, but whether you can actually do those business pieces as well. Um, I mean, I was talking to somebody recently and I probably do less health and safety day-to-day -day work um, every day than I do running the business. So, you know, if something comes through, I have to deal with it. So at the weekend, I got a letter from HMRC saying, you know, you owe us X, Y, and Z, and that's something that I have to sort out. So the kind of buck stops with me. Um, so it's about looking at, looking at it hol holistically and being realistic about, you know, is that something that you want to go into? It could be that you decide, you know what, I'm just gonna set up something very, very simple, um, just with myself, um, just do a couple of days work um, a week um, and keep it quite low level. But remember, you are still running a business and there's an awful lot that goes on behind the scenes in respect of running a business. And there's definitely more admin 
um, than you can ever imagine. So think very, very carefully about that. Um, I'm going to go on to some top tips in a second, um, but my absolute first top tip is going to be if this is something that you're considering, um, find a really good accountant. Um, it's incredibly easy to set up a business. It's easier than you think <laughs> you might think it is. Um, but a good accountant will guide you through all of the hoops that you need to find, you know, that you will find your way through. But it is important that you've got those skills. But I think anybody who's been in the military is, is used to kind of having things like that you know, having particularly the financial side, you'll probably find that you quite enjoy it. You know, when I first started in business, I, I had to do everything myself and gradually I've taken on people who, who take on these roles. Um, but I quite enjoyed the numbers. Um, and I think it's important that you don't just, I, I loved what Sarah was saying about finding your strengths. Um, but you, you, if you are going to create a business, your, your strengths need to be not just in the health and safety, but in these other areas as well. So it's thinking about whether you have that, those skills. And I think having a coach like Sarah would be, would be great for any of that. Um, but you need to be ready to run that business and you need to be ready for the, you know, I often talk about it, it can be a real feast or famine. So there are advantages and there's disadvantages. One of the reasons why I went into business was because um, I've always believed that health and safety can be a huge driver for success. Um, and I'm quite directional about it. I wanted to develop my own way of doing health and safety within the businesses that I worked alongside and partnered. And it's definitely given me those opportunities. Um, I wouldn't be able to do the things that I do for IOSH um, if it wasn't for the freedom that I have, um, because basically I, I'm my own boss. But it is a world of feast and famine. Um, and particularly when you start, um, you know, the first few years can be extremely challenging, can be extremely difficult. Um, you know, I'd left a big corporate, everyone was saying, you know, we'll definitely give you work. And it's, it's actually, it's, it's not as easy as that. It's, you know, you've got to nurture the marketing side as well as the finance side. Um, there's IT to think about. Um, so there's all of these different things. But at the same time, that can make it really exciting. You know, I love the fact that I'm not just doing health and safety every day. So just a few, there's loads of top tips on here, which you can have a look at. Um, but just a few top tips from me is really do your market research. So you may have a great idea that you think is a fantastic idea for a business, but actually is that going to translate into the marketplace? Um, have a great accountant. I'm, I'm going to keep saying that. Um, things like networks, the rest of the panelists have already said how incredibly important that is. Um, building up a network, building up a social media following, all of these things, marketing, it doesn't happen overnight. So you need to really think about the financial aspects of that and have that kind of buffer potentially behind you. Um, Big one is, you know, if you're going to go out and, and sell a product or you're going to sell a service is, you know, it is about selling. It is about customer care um, and, and keeping your promises is incredibly important as well. Um, but what I would say is, you know, if you if this is something that you really want to do, I think that those of you in the military have, you know, and I've seen it in Jimmy, a, a real steel determination. And, and that would stand you in good stead if, if business is something for you. Um, so, you know, a couple of people I admire who I said, you know, what makes a great consultant? Because I think you need to look at this. Um, and I love this. It's about, you know, what we do is take massively complex scenarios and lots and lots of things and, and, and really bring them down to, a, 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 you know, to help and support other businesses. Um, and, and being able to sort of cut through the noise. So if that's you, that's potentially, you know, this is a, potentially a direction that you could take. Um, and there's just a few extra sources of support here. So I'm also a member of the consultancy group and there's a really great guide on the consultancy group um, website on IOSH, which is all about 
becoming a consultant and it takes you through all of the different aspects of setting up a business um, creating terms and conditions um, how you're going to deliver that service and, and and I've put alongside this also the code of conduct as well because the code of conduct also touches on the kind of things that we need to do um, because if you're going through a tough time in business it can be very tempting to just take take things on whatever um, but we've kind of, we've got to be true to ourselves and we've got to hold on to those values and I think again um, you know that's certainly something that I see um, in military personnel those strong values which I think would, would stand you in good stead um, potentially as business owners so if this is something that you're thinking about then you know do have a look at those guides as well um, do link in with myself on LinkedIn link in with the um, consultancy group you know it is that there's there's a big um, there's a big network of consultants within IOSH um, and certainly in the consultancy group where we host a number of different webinars um, and we are there to support and help anybody who's thinking about going down this route. Um, but I guess my, my end piece is, is think very carefully about it and certainly go in with your eyes wide open. So yeah, and thank you, Jimmy, for having me. Thanks very much, Louise. Um, just before you do go, I'll just um, give you a question just to just to ponder on um, while you're just uh, thinking about that. Um, it came into the chat one, but um, it'll be good for a good one as well. I'm um, just going to try and find it. Um, okay. Yes, Louise, uh, did you go straight into consultancy or did you start a full time job and then slowly uh, bring down your hours? So if you want to think about that one and yeah. come back to us, that'd be fantastic. Okay, everyone, um, just a quick one then, uh, just from me. Um, I'm not going to take much of your time. A lot of everyone has said has been absolutely on point. Um, you know, from Mark, and, and I know about Mark's story. I, I served with him when he was going through all those things at the time and, 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 and the stuff he talks about with um, Husey coming through and all the rest of it, that was all that part and through friendships. What we're trying to do here is to create something not so formal, but for you to know it's there. And not for people to think, ah, Mark, maybe give him a buzz. It's, it's that place where we can go to. And that, that will take shape. How it looks, I don't know. But I'll be speaking to the panellists afterwards and speaking to IOSH in general. And, and hopefully get feedback from, from you folks afterwards as well. For my story, it was exactly the same. You know, I left in, in 2011, finished my last two years at HQ Land Forces. Did some courses. You know, there's people on, this, uh, people on here today. You know, people like Alex Spinks, who we were on courses together. Uh, lots of other people, uh, too many to, to, to mention at the moment. Uh, and again, I go back to my good friend and mentor and, 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 and brother from another mother, Simon Donnelly, who took me on, had me in a, a webinar similar to this, and said, I'm going to give him a chance. And, and everything went for me, but there was a lot of luck as well um, for me. And, and that's why I talk about these skills, because I didn't know I had these skills. And, and, and this is the thing I want to get across and, and take all that stuff that Josh has said, Louise has said, Mark has said, Sarah has said, and combine all that and it's you. It's a veteran. You know, you've got everything there. You just don't know you've got it. It's like the old Morecambe and Wise sketch, if any of you are old enough, with Andre Previn playing the piano. You know, you're playing the right tune, just not necessarily in the right order. And that's the same with us veterans, but these skills, and they're all jumbled up and they're all there, but we just don't know how to use them. And I certainly didn't. And I remember saying to uh, Simon, Simon, um, safety advice, uh, what do I do? I don't know. Uh, you know safety, so advice. And, and I sort of use my personality, as Josh said, and use my technical skills. And if I just go back to what Josh said, behavioural competencies, nail them, because they are what you are. All right, that's my sort of rant for the moment. So... Just before we go on then, um, I'm going to start uh, putting out some questions there and I'm going to come back to you straight away, Mark. And, and one of the questions was from Lamin Darbo, who you shared with them, but Mark, what was the biggest hurdle you had to overcome in adjusting to civil life? I'm still serving the Royal Artillery, finished my BSc Occupational Safety Health Environment with a first class honours, fantastic Lamin. Starting the MS program, MSc program next month with the University of Greenwich. I've been there. Second question, what advice you got for someone like me? Many thanks. And all the panelists, can you put your videos on, please? 
uh, <clears throat> Lamin, hopefully you're still there. Um, and I know we're friends on LinkedIn as well. Um, I, I think that the best advice I can give you is to echo something that Josh touched on as well, is to get yourself out and try and get experience before you step over that threshold. You've got some fantastic qualifications. Hopefully you'll get a chance whilst you're still in uniform for the military organization to use the competence that you've got. Um, I became by pure default, uh, the health and safety warrant officer for a regiment of 1200 people. If you're in the Royal Artillery, perhaps you're in an organization that could use you in a role somewhere as well. So not only can you show competence in your, you know, within the, the, I guess the qualifications that you've got, but you can start putting aspects of that into practice within the organization, which looks good on a CV. Also, um, speaking about something that I was lucky enough to find myself in, I had a friend at the time who was ex Royal Military Police. His wife uh, was, she had a, a fairly low level health and safety practice doing um, risk assessments for the YMCA. So I had a chat over a cup of coffee, told uh, this particular lady who, whose name was Linda that um, I was interested in health and safety and I just achieved my first qualification. And I asked if I could go along completely unpaid and voluntarily and just watch and get an idea of what was encompassed within the whole risk assessment and site assessment process. Um, and she was kind enough to take me on that. And over about six or seven months, um, I was then allowed to go out and do these visits on my own, unpaid, um, because I was still being paid by the military. But what I did get back was travel expenses. But again, I did that for about six months. And just having those little bits of competence and experience and being able to speak about those at interview was absolutely priceless. Okay. Because um, all the qualifications in the world are fantastic. And don't get me wrong, they will definitely help. Proving to people at interview that you can put those into practice, you've come across certain problems and you've solved them, should really help you, I think. Mark, can I just jump on that as well, Mark? I mean, that's exactly what I did, and we didn't know that we could do that, and people don't know they can do that. Can I just, that's a brilliant answer, Mark. Josh, can you just literally 30 seconds come in and back that up in some way? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I spoke about it in our, um, in, in the presentation where we had three people this, uh, in the last 12 months that have, that have taken the volunteering work they've done um, and in the resettlement, and I'm not, I'm not a veteran myself, so I don't know how it all works, but I know that obviously you get the funding for the qualification. So certainly not saying don't do that. You, you must have a basic understanding of technical competence in health and safety for anything to work, but it is more around getting out there and actually learning how to in interact and engage with people and using the skills that you learn in the forces to, to deliver that. So yeah, right. I think absolutely important to uh, to get volunteering. If you can't get paid work experience, then I mean, you'll get your, you should get your travel expenses paid, but you know, that's, you're speculating to accumulate for the future and, and it's Thanks, really Josh. important to do that. Brilliant mate, thank you. Sarah, just jump in quickly, literally 30 seconds, you've got some to add? Yeah, sure. I mean, it goes back to really, I really like the point that was made earlier about, um, and it's been made a couple of times since then, it is about how you come over and present yourself, specific achievements and what the results were. Because I know as somebody that's hired people from different walks of life, I think as Mark was just saying, it's about how you come across an interview. It's not always about, because you want, it's about your attitude. Can you be proactive? Can you deal with pressure? Can you think on the spot? So those sorts of things to me, certainly when I was recruiting, just as important, if not more than any kind of qualification. So pull out those achievements. Outstanding. Thank you, Sarah. And lastly, Louise, 30 seconds. <laughs> um, I mean, what I would say is, Anybody can set up a business and it may well be you are more suited to running a business than actually doing the health and safety side of it um, because it's quite rare to have both skills um, and it, you know, depending on what you've done in the military, you've probably done all of the business stuff without actually realising it. Um, so it is about thinking back to what Sarah was saying and saying, where are your strengths? Because actually, if your strengths are, you know, are, are in numbers and um, looking ahead and planning and, and juggling lots of things, which I know happens in the military, um, it may well be that you have a passion for health and safety, but actually, perhaps you should be a business person. Got you. No, great, great show. Absolutely. Thank you, Louise. Okay. So, um, Sarah, just before you answer your uh, first question I gave you earlier on uh, from, from Alex, um, there's a question here from Lee Tyson. Uh, he comes in at 7.19. Can you see that question on the Q&A, Sarah? 
Sorry, yeah, which one is it from? Uh, it's Tyson, 719 p.m. Yeah, have you can any you tips? Answer, can, you, can you answer that question next? Yeah, absolutely. Have you any tips on analyzing? Job, sorry, I'm getting loads of comments popping up, running over it. Da, 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 da. Yeah, so I think you need to, again, I think this is where LinkedIn comes in. So have a look at similar jobs and see if there's anything specific about this job or whether there are general attributes that they need around this kind of arena of this job, if you like, and how you can get them. Maybe map it and, and look. I was a big fan of going, you know, let's have a look at the job advert. If I think this is something I could do and I would be good at, I think as um, Josh was saying earlier, that you can actually adapt your CV. You don't just have to have one CV because you've probably got a multitude of skills. So have a look, map your advert against your experiences and see where you can adapt it. So just have a look at that detail and, and go through it. And again, a, a quick one, just before you go on to Alex's question, I gave you a one. I need to read it out again, or have you, have you got it, Sarah? Sorry, it's about adapting, wasn't yeah, it? I'll come back to it? Yeah, I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, and also, um, Lee, you can also contact me. I've just uh, sent you my um, email address, which I'll give everybody at the end, but uh, just so you've got it. Um, and that's all because you were really, I wouldn't give it to anybody else. Okay, so um, Sarah, uh, the one from Alex. Uh, this is great, I always have to go up. Um, Sarah, I totally agree with coaching is a must for those leaving the forces. Have you served a full career? It's paramount that you learn to deal with people and attitudes differently to those in the military. And Mark touched on that earlier on. Being able to adapt is a key attribute, but recognising what you need to adapt is difficult. I had a great coach and it was a huge benefit. For those without the opportunity I was given, how do you advise people to identify what areas they may need to adapt? And you've got about a minute and a half. Yes, yeah, so basically I think a really good place to start is where are your challenges? And again, you can use a similar exercise before and say, are there any co common situations that you come up against that either really stress you out or are really challenging? And those might be the areas where you need to adopt a more flexible, open mindset, because there's kind of two different kinds of mindsets. There's the why me mindset, being stuck in a kind of victim mode, if you like, about why me, why is this happening to me? And then I worked with someone and over a few months, we shifted that closed, fixed mindset into that open mindset of like, hang on a minute, I've got loads of skills and strengths. How do I? So that's a really good way to sort of flex your mindset. And with any coach, with the most of the coaching that I do, yes, it's about goals. Yes, it's about plans and identifying where you want to go. But so much of it is about the mindset. You've got to have that flexible open mindset to be able to um, overcome, make sure your value is bigger than your fears and your action is bigger than your fears. So identify those kind of areas where you think, do you know what, there's a theme here that's holding me back. Where do I need to shift my thinking? Where do I need to shift what I'm saying to myself in my mind? Uh, and a good coach should be working on that as much as they are about goals, et cetera. So I hope that answers the question. Absolutely priceless, Sarah. And you know, there's so much, so many people getting so many comments here and, and getting so much value from this. This is just, you know, I'm absolutely blown away. Great comments, thank you. Okay, let's move on quickly to Josh. Josh, I just sent you a really tricky question. Are you quite comfortable answering that one, mate? Yes, yeah. So this was around um, how can um, OSH professionals help individuals that are going into other parts of the business. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose just to, for clarity, I, I, I think that it might be interpreted in two different ways. I think if you're already in the business, um, then it's around broadening your horizons and getting involved in things perhaps slightly outside of your remit. So can you become involved in projects or um, wider business discussions to help open your uh, experience to things that perhaps wouldn't be in the day to day of a health and safety professional? Um, but if it's about individuals coming into the organization and how you can how you can help them then I think it's about that collaboration with other other departments if you've built good relationships and networks then you'll be able to recommend people to different departments so not quite sure exactly what it is that you wanted but I hope one of those two answers can help <laughs> okay brilliant okay uh, if anybody has anything to add into that one Louise Sarah Mark anything nope okay let's move on then Louise thanks Josh no problem Oh, Josh, just a quick one before you come in, Louise. I've just had the question come back again from Keith. Veterans must not be afraid to ask for reasonable adjustment. That was something he wanted to say. Does that happen much uh, in, in the business, Josh? Yeah, I, I mean, it's 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 re it's a it's a tricky it's it's tricky when we speak to clients. I mean, we to be open and honest with you, some clients really they they've seen the ability that 
forces in the x-force individuals have had and have accommodated to help them on their journey to get them there there are other clients out there who have had x-force individuals that haven't performed very well and it's it's made it more difficult for x-force individuals to get into that business from our perspective we always push that you know, the softer skills are the things that count. So it's not really about someone who's X-Forces or not X-Forces. It's what are, the, what are the behaviors that this individual portrays, regardless of their previous career, and can they translate that into a way that will be of benefit to you and your business? So I think it's, it's just really important you break those barriers down by showcasing your behaviors and your, um, uh, and your personality much more than uh, your technical competence. And then if you need the support or the kind of guidance to get you there businesses will help you with that but it's about being the right person to do that thanks very much josh brilliant so we on to you yeah um did you want me to answer my question that you yes, gave please. Yes, yeah please. um so so um my question earlier was around um did i um trans you know how did i transition from having a full-time job over to to running a business um and what i would say is that um i this is why i'm saying please go into it with with your eyes wide open um because i didn't expect it to be anywhere near as difficult and challenging and hard as it was um i literally left you know working for a big corporate one day and i was I set up my business. I think my business was incorporated within the week. Um, and I wasn't prepared for how difficult it was to get work. Um, and I, I really had to dig in um, and, you know, put in the hours. I still have to put in the hours um, to constantly get the customers in because you'll send out a lot of proposals and, and most of them won't come back. Um, so the answer to that question is it really depends on your personal circumstances and what it is that you want to achieve um, in terms of working for yourself. Um, if you have got significant financial um, obligations, it's something that you need to think about very, very carefully. Um, I wasn't ready for how difficult it was at the time. Um, so it is about planning, it is about your networks, it is about going into it with your eyes wide open. And I think if you can transition more gradually, that would probably be a wise thing to do. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Louise. Anybody got any, just literally a couple of seconds to reply to that if you want. I'm going to start coming at quite thick and fast with questions now. And I the, sorry, Jimmy, if I can just say, I think, I mean, we see people that transition from a very successful career in health and safety like Louise or even longer careers who have moved into consultancy and have really struggled. So I, I just would reiterate what Louise says. It is, it is, you have to be the right type of person to do so. And there are a lot of people who don't have the career, but create a fantastic consultancy business for themselves because they have the right skills. And there's people that have a fantastic health and safety career. And honestly, within six months, they're winding up their business because they can't make it work. So it is, I completely agree with what Louise is saying. You have to make sure it's the right thing for you to do because you are you become a salesperson rather than a safety professional. And they are two different skill sets. Yeah. And again, again about personal circumstances there's more than one way to skin a cat like a career change it's like thinking about what do i want to earn what do i need to earn at the moment where else can i get some funding perhaps to help me with the business and similar to what the guys have been saying the words that i've found keep popping to my mind when i've been setting up businesses is perseverance and resilience i mean it's just you've got to be able to have that and that self-motivation uh, to... It is about never giving up, but Jimmy, I think, I mean, you and I work together and you know I never stop working and you have to have that work ethic to make it work. But I think the people on this call probably have that work ethic, of course, um, yeah. but a hundred percent what Josh says, I deal more with sales probably than everyday health and safety. So um, okay. you've got to, you've got to know you've got that skill set. Thanks, thanks, Louise. Brilliant. Mark, I need to bring you in here just to sort of you know, literally, you know, half a minute just to sort of join all that up as someone who's who's the veteran who's who's been successful. I mean, uh, <clears throat> there's no one answer to a lot of the questions that we've got out there, Jim. There's, there's people asking about the Armed Forces Covenant. There's people asking about um, what's the best way to broach the salary subject. All I'll say is um, th there are two or three golden threads that have been mentioned for me, the Josh, Sarah, uh, or Louise that really need to be brought together. 
Um, in order, I think, for the majority of veterans listening into this to perhaps get the most effect. There's no one answer, but there are a number of answer threads that can answer lots of queries. Um, perseverance, knowing the market, understanding exactly what you want, having an idea of how you're going to get it, having, um, I guess, a degree of information before you start on the qualifications road, um, and having an idea of the direction that you see yourself going into, although things can land in your lap and that can change. But above all is trying to maintain a degree of optimism. Um, give yourself a fighting chance when you step outside that gate. All the military qualifications you've gained over the years may not necessarily translate into the civilian world, but elements of the things you've learned and the experiences you've got along the way will. And what you have to concentrate on is that behavioral wealth that, that you have in addition to the level of qualification that you may or may not achieve. It really speaks volumes. The whole, the whole um, shoulders back, chin up element does work to a degree. It shows an element of confidence, but the, the downside is you can be loud. You can be a little bit too I centric Absolutely. as in I've done this and I've done that. There's lots of different answers, but the big one is understanding where you're going and stick to your guns. Yeah, okay, I can definitely um, back that one. If that was me, and everything you've said there was me. It's quite scary. Thanks, Mark. Um, literally, we've got about sort of 15 minutes left, and I wanted to start rattling through some of these questions, and they've got to be short, sharp, and, and punchy, people. So, one of the first things was um, um, just a quick one to you, uh, Josh, really quickly. I'm not going to come to anybody else. Do you find that some employers can't recognise your experience and competence as they are not civilian qualifications, Josh? Yes, we do. And um, that's the employer's issue. The issue that we have to try to overcome in working with individuals in that position is we need to translate the two-dimensional CV into a three-dimensional person that the, the employer can actually see and try to get you in front of them. So I always say the CV is um, designed to get you an interview, not to get you the job. So you need to try to get through the door. And we're utilizing and embracing some new technology, video interview technology that we submit alongside candidates. Because if the, quali if the, if the background or experience isn't there, but someone can see from a video interview, the personality is helping our conversion rate of actually getting people in front of the clients. And then it's down to you to sell yourself. So yes, clients do not see it, but we're trying to overcome that through a number of different ways. And some of that coaching, that excellent coaching you were talking about earlier on. And everybody, please reach out to Josh because he is there and he's there for you. And he's not just saying that and he would really like to hear from you. Uh, Zach Atkinson here. Uh, any veterans in the Manchester area doing health and safety in the construction, uh, construction industry? Zach, if you want to email me on james.quinn at irish.com, I'll find out for you. I'm the chair, I'm the vice chair of the construction group as well. Let me know, email me. Tiny Baker, lovely to hear from you, big man. Um, for those of you who know Tiny Baker, a legend in Army Rugby and um, Co Rugby, uh, and a lovely, lovely man. It's one for you, Mark, if you can reach out to Tiny at some stage. He's quite active on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn, LinkedIn, people. There you go. Priceless. There you go. Uh, Tiny, Tiny, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, he just wants to know about any um, remit or, or other course, Mark. So yeah, find me on LinkedIn and I'll, I'll do what I can. No, no problems. Uh, Keith, yeah, done. Uh, Don uh, To David Tefani, David, network with people in this webinar and seek placements with companies one to two weeks. Take leave and choose your industry carefully. You'll hear what Ash said earlier on. Uh, you'll find Ashley um, on the um, on LinkedIn as well. And if you want to get in touch with Ashley, let me know. Send me an email. I'll put you in touch with them. David, I have spoken to a couple of people that was looking uh, of input from others, especially from our forces. Okay, you've got that, I think, David. Um, Lawrence, Lawrence Webb, another uh, stalwart of the um, IOS volunteering place and um, a strategic director of a, a well-known construction company. Environmental, no, no, uh, Lawrence, some really good points there, Josh. I find that leadership and project management skills, along with the ability to adapt and appreciate issues from a ve very practical point of view, are highly valued. Quick comment, you and Sarah and Louise, please. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many leadership skills that veterans have that will translate into a commercial environment. So, um, again, work, speaking to us, speaking to mentors or coaches will help you be able to translate that experience you have into the practical uh, answers that you can give at interview stage. But, yeah, you have, you, have the you have the skill set that people are looking for in the bucket load. So it's yeah. just about translating that into, uh, into the interview process. Thanks, Josh. Sarah? 
Yeah, and there's also things like disk profiling. So I do disk profiling. There's loads of other tools out there. And I'd recommend if you've never had something like that done before, have it done now and think about yourself in the work context. Because a good one will tell you, this is what you, you are like generally at work. This is what you like under pressure. So you exaggerate your styles under pressure. And this is how you communicate. This is what motivates you. And have a look and see, right, hang on a minute. There's some blind spots here I need to work on. So I definitely recommend some kind of, uh, you know, whether it's Gallup Strength Finder, Insights, Disk Profiling, get yourself a psychometric tool done so you've got that data to have a look at and go, well, if I want that career, what strengths do I need to build up? Because today it's very much about um, flexible leadership, using different styles of leadership at different times. And there's a place for certain command and control type approach, but sometimes you have to mix it up a bit. Yeah. You know what, Sarah, you just nailed something there that is a key, a key part of, of, of veterans uh, the, the more they serve in the in in, in, in the service in the forces, they, they continue to improve on those, um, yeah. those skills, and and that's a great great point to have that ability to to have those different skills as you go through. Brilliant, Louise. Very quickly. Yeah, I mean, I would say when it's you know being in business, sometimes the hardest things that I deal with are around people, are around HR, around finance, and that gets really stressful. Um, and you need to have a high um, degree of resilience and I think we've got that in our you know ex-military um, so it's not necessarily going to be you know the health and safety work that you do that that you you know it, it potentially is the business part that you'll you'll pull on you know okay. that you need those skills for. Thank you. Uh, can I just um, Dimple this is very unusual and please tell me if I can I've just noticed that Steve Jeffrey uh, is one of the um, attendees. Steve is a, a very successful uh, leadership um, uh, leadership professional. If that is you, Steve, can you take your mic off when uh, Dimple allows you? It might not be. Okay. Hey, is that, Jimmy. Is that can Steve you hear me, Jim? Mate? Yeah, that's you. Is that you, Steve? Yep. Can you, it you is, mate. Have you got any quick, a quick minute of your time, Stephen? I didn't know you were coming on the call or I'd have come to you earlier on. Could you just spend a minute, just um, maybe tying some of this up before we wrap up, mate? Uh, yeah, what's the question you was asking there, Jimmy? Sorry. Uh, we're just asking about leadership in general. You do a lot of stuff. I know you do a lot of workshops and a lot, and it's part of what you do. Uh, is there, is there any, any tip that you could give any of our veterans that are leaving? Um, I think it's uh, very much what Sarah was saying there. It's about making sure that you are able to translate all the great skills of leadership that you've leveraged in your time in the services. You know, I did 25 years and I've been working in the Middle East now for the last 10 years. And, you know, I've, I've worked for over 100 companies now translating some of the great skills that we had in the leadership arena in the military into the commercial world. Um, and actually it's been even easier this year to leverage that because the leadership adaption that we've had to do with leadership in a crisis is, is, is very paramount to how people have had to pivot and how people have had to adapt um, to a variety of, of leadership still. So it's not about having a fixed leadership style it's about having a, a variety and a big toolbox of leadership and just being authentic in your own style of leadership, but having a variety of different tools to use for appropriate situations. Oh, outstanding. Thanks very much, mate. And I, I look forward to catching up with you someday. And, and, and thanks for just doing that off the cuff. Just to, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, nearly midnight out here in Dubai at the moment. It's 40 degrees, so uh, uh, you caught me off guard there. Yeah, no problems, mate. And, and the professional you are just come up with a great answer. Thanks, Steve. You're a top man. No worries. No oh, worries. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, great, great webinar, by the way. Thanks, mate. We'll, 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 keep, we'll go on LinkedIn with you as well. We'll, we'll look out for that. Thanks, Steve. Well, Jimmy, thanks. can I just... Jimmy, can I just say something? Um, Sarah yeah, mentioned around the disc profiling. Um, at Principal People, that's one of the profiles that we use, um, and, and there's another one. But for the disc profiling, if any participant would like to have a disc profile done, um, I would be happy to do that complimentary for any of the veterans, and oh, wow. uh, we'll share that with them. So if anybody would like to do that, get in touch. We'll, um, we'll put you through the process, and um, yeah, we'll share the results with you directly. So um, Thanks very much, Josh. Brilliant. And I've just noticed Rod Douglas, who, who picked me up one day in London when I was really down when I just left the army. He was my section commander when I was in the Scots Guards. Nice to see you, Rod, and as well as all the rest of you. Okay, so just going quickly through now. Um, can, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just say something to, in terms of my kind of wrap-up? Um, I'm, I'm going to get a plug-in now for the 
branches and the groups in IOSH. Um, I'm also a branch chair of Chilton. And if you were thinking about running your own business, um, I would say get involved with the branch. If you want to get involved with IOSH Chilton, um, I'm creating a branch and you're going to use all of those business skills. You're going to develop marketing skills. You're going to develop communication skills, treasury skills, all of them. So if, if it is something that you want to do in the future, perhaps, um, I would say get involved with the branch because you can pick up some of those skills. Okay. I'm going to give you all a minute quickly as soon as I've rattled through these. Thanks, Sarah. Right, just quickly, Mike Leap, thanks, Mike. Make full use of the CLM system. Ensure you align all your external qualifications. I'm sure Josh will nod to that. CLM activity, CMI, LMI, leadership management. I've done it all. It's easy to get done if you've served. Get in touch with me if you haven't. Uh, how many of the past support the Armed Forces Covenant? That'd be interesting. Yeah, I do. And uh, it'd be nice to see lots of companies doing that. Thanks, Keith, for putting the link on. Mark, um, what's the best way to get all these skills? We have military or veterans out there in civvy speak. Speak to Josh, mate. Um, I'm due to leave the Army in a few months. Um, I'm looking at uh, sticking to health and safety. What's the best route out here? Get in touch with me, Martin, or get in touch with Mark, or Louise, or Sarah, or George, or another 40,000 Irish members, or all the people on this call. Martin Jones, lovely to see you, my friend. Um, he's really enjoyed it. Eddie Manners, another another one of my um, uh, sergeants from the Scots Guards. Nice to see you, Eddie. Thank you. Great comments. Um, I'll get that question to you at some stage, Eddie, um, and use your week of resettlement. I've already got Guy coming in for two weeks of his GRT to London. That's easily sorted. Um, how should an interviewee respond when asked for salary expectations? And I mean like five seconds, Josh. It depends if it's been put on the advert. I think the the thing that we generally say to candidates, as long as you know it's in the right ballpark, don't focus on salary interview. Say that you're interested in the opportunity and that's the most important thing. And if you if they feel that you're the most suitable candidate for the role, you'd like to discuss it at that point. But you don't want to be drawn into a bidding war in the interview process. It's not the right thing to do. Wonderful. And um, for people looking for employer experience, spread your network and use a week of your resettlement. It's very valuable and it could take you on after this week if there's a vacancy there. Very true, Eddie. Right, all of you, starting with Mark, you've got literally 30 seconds as your summary. Uh, if anybody wants to link up with me on LinkedIn, ask me questions in depth, I'll be more than happy to come back to you. There's no question that I won't try and answer. I won't say and I'll, I'll be able to answer all of them, um, but I welcome anything and anything from anyone. Thank you very much, Mark. The fantastic Sarah Jones. Yeah, basically, believe in yourself. See any t any change as a positive rather than a negative. Fear hates action. Remember, as I'm sure you know, um, I've got some slides coming around later, but get in touch with me on LinkedIn, Sarah Jones. Uh, you'll see my picture on there and a big banner. So, And it's got my website details on there. And we're going to try and do some more work together after this as yeah, well. So that me, it's going to be wonderful. Yeah, Thank you. I'm so too. happy that you, you, you gave up your time on a, on, a, on a cold call via Twitter. Thanks very much, Sarah. Oh, and a, and, a, and a heads up from Louise, I must admit. Louise, quickly. Um, yeah, if you if you see yourself going into business, please go in with your eyes wide open. Get some professional advice from an accountant. Um, by all means, link up with me. Link into the consultancy group. Have a look at all the information that's in there. But know that they're potentially two different skill sets. Um, but if, if you have a passion, I'd say go for it. Oh, thank you very much, Louise, and wonderful again. Josh Huggins, fantastic gentleman. Yep. Um, firstly, thank you guys for all that you do for, for the all that you've done for the country. I think it's, um, it's remarkable and it's only right that we give back. So that's the first thing. But secondly, if you wish to get in contact, please do. It's j.huggins at principalpeople.co.uk. Happy to help. And the option of the DIS profile is there for, for you all and we'd be more than happy to help you in any way. So please just get in contact. And, and to you guys, to, to you folks as well, I nearly did it, Louise, to you folks, wonderful. Um, there's so many positive comments coming through. The amount of energy that's coming through the chat is just absolutely extraordinary. This has just been an absolute, oh, it's just amazing. So we'll continue this. Uh, we'll get all the emails together. We will do something with this. I'm sure um, Dimple will reach out to all of you via email. Um, I'll get in touch with the panelists. We'll send all of you an email panelist and we'll catch up in the next few days just to have a wash up if we can for 15 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, from me, I'm absolutely gobsmacked that in the back of a WhatsApp with an old friend, Mark Roberts, we've created something and we'll continue to create it. I'm just going to give a round of applause to our amazing panel.
Thank you all so much. Uh, thanks, Louise. Thanks, George. Thanks, thanks very much. Take care, everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye.